Hello everyone, welcome back to another YouTube video. My name is John Hammond and we're taking another look at another Google Capture the Flag challenge from the recent Google CTF that went on this past weekend. Again, I bring this to you with transparency and honesty. This is not a challenge that I solved during the competition and absolutely probably would not have been able to solve without looking at the write-ups after the fact. So I use that to foot stomp and emphasize and highlight Write-ups are incredible. You should not have any shame in going to read those write-ups or going to try and learn those other solutions or seeing the tools and the tricks and techniques that other people use to really solve that challenge. So let's dive in. I want to try and showcase this beginner challenge and it is noted as an easy challenge and it's only worth 50 points. It's kind of one of the lowest tier things that Google CTF had to offer, though Google CTF is a hard CTF. Anyway, this challenge says dust off the cobwebs, let's reverse, and there is a downloadable file. So I will fire up my terminal, and I created a folder that I have been working in when I worked through this live, and in the moment I created a beginner directory for that challenge, and I'm just going to clear everything out so you can get a fresh perspective, because I probably had some dangling leftover files there. So I had wget and downloaded that file, which is a big long string, and I'm just going to go ahead and move that to beginner, or I suppose is really what the name of this challenge is. Oh, and that's just a zip archive, so actually I'll remove that to beginner to beginner.zip, and I'll go ahead and unzip that. So it extracted an a dot out which is typically the file name extension you'd get after compiling a binary. And this is in fact a binary. It is an ELF 64-bit, so Linux program with dynamically linked interpreter not stripped. Okay, so we might still have some debugging information. Let me go ahead and mark that as executable and run it. So it asked me for a flag, uh, which I do not know off the top of my head. So I'll type in please sub and weirdly enough, that's not the flag. So the obvious easy things that like we're kind of conditioned to do that you might see in a classic, maybe, okay, cheesy beginner CTF, which Google CTF is not, uh, you would go ahead and run strings on that file and maybe you'll get lucky and you'll see the flag in plain text and there you go, you win, you get those points. Uh, in this case, I just see the beginning of the flag. I see that CTF curly braces, but nothing else. We could do some other things. I could try and run like L trace or S trace to go ahead and see, okay, what library function calls, what, what stuff is actually happening when I run this binary. I can see it's prompting me again for some input as I run it and step through it. And it does a string compare with these weird things. So in the moment when I was trying this myself, I thought like, huh, can I just like print this out? I'll use printf so it'll try and actually use these raw values and bytes here. I'll use that and I'll just pipe it into a.out. Will that give me the flag? No, that fails. Okay. So I, I thought like, well, it, it, will that happen if I L trace that with that input? And that actually seems to start to do some other comparison which I thought is was weird and funky and just not doing what I would have expected. So at that point with strings and L-trace and grep or whatever, all those kind of easy low-hanging fruit out of the way, then you'd want to go into just like real actual reversing or debugging or trying to figure out what this program really does. You can do that in GDB if you want to do some dynamic analysis. If you want to do static analysis, try and look at like the disassembly or the decompiled code that you might be able to pull out. You could do that with Hopper or you could do that with Ida or you could do it with Ghidra and... Personally, I like Ghidra because it is free <laughs> and that is a good thing. So I have it installed and downloaded over in uh, my op directory. If you don't have Ghidra, you can go ahead and download it. Uh, simply Googling Ghidra, you can find the result here. Software engineering, software reverse engineering suite of tools developed at the NSA in support of the cybersecurity mission. So they give you actually an installation guide. It just is built off of Java. So you have to make sure you have a Java runtime and a JVM set up but you should be able to just fire up Ghidra once you've got it all set up and prepared. Uh, apparently, that window is extremely tiny. <laughs> I hope you'll be able to see some of that. And I'd already go, gone ahead and configured a project because I've been looking at this previously. Um, so it does probably already have a Google CTF project already created. If you don't have that, you can just hit new project and then save a space. And then you can press I on the keyboard to like import a new binary, a new program that you're going to work with. So I've got a dot out that we've opened up and the code browser is already open. So I don't need this 
other window or the new one that created. Now we're in Ghidra. Magic. We'll go over to the symbol tree, and because we know from the file command, hey, they don't have debugging symbols stripped out of this, then we could actually maybe look for regular function names like the main function or like the start of where this program will begin. So I'll go ahead and search for that, filter in for it in that symbol tree window there, and I can click on that main function. Um, I realize this text might be kind of small. I don't know if I can amp up this size, uh, but hopefully you can kind of full screen. And I don't think we'll spend a ton of time in here. If anything, let me take this code. Uh, and I'll just copy it and I guess throw it in sublime text. How about that? Subble paste. There we go. Let's set that syntax to C. So we have a main function, right? And it is going to set up a couple variables here. Looks like it's going to display that message that we saw just simply prompting us for the flag and then read in from standard input with scanf. Uh, looks like it stores that in local 38. So let's actually change all local 38 to be like our input. There we go. And what it's going to do is then p shuff b. Okay. And it's going to shuffle maybe our input. And then concatenate other things with bit shifts and oddities and weirdness and randomness. Oh, and it even has an XOR thing kind of put in place. So it does a lot of mangling and control over our input. Okay, that makes things harder, but that's obviously what we would want to reverse if we were doing some reverse engineering. After that's all done, we go ahead and do our comparison. So we saw that string compare that was ran when we use ltrace or strace, and it's going to test our input with seemingly local 28. Huh. Okay, that must be Ogvar 3 is a portion of this. I'm unsure what that's... Oh, it, it, it's, it's reading out 16 bytes in there. Or hex, hex 10. I say 16 because that's kind of just as you would read it, right? If I were so... If I were up Python, 0x10 is going to be 16 in base 16 and hexadecimal, right? That 0x prefix. And it's going to check if it matches the expected prefix at the first four. So that must be the CTF open curly brace that we saw. And it will go ahead and display, okay, return success probably because it's in the main function, but it's going to go to these labels or these addresses if it is the correct flag. So in Ghidra, can I actually click on that like expected prefix, see what that is? Does it tell me? I see a C here. I think, and I, I'm, I'm not smart, I'm trying to learn. If I can, like, set the type, I think it is, or address this itself. If I right-click that, can I specify what it actually is to change it? Yeah, data, and then terminated C string. Did that get it? No, it didn't. How should that be done? Can I go to that? Okay, clicking on that will bring me to CTF and I can see those bytes there. Good enough. Good enough. Obviously, you can see me fumbling. <laughs> like, uh, this is not my strong shoot. Reverse engineering is not my forte. Binary exploitation. I, I still got a lot to learn, right? And I don't, I don't hide that from anyone. Uh, I'm still trying to get better too. So when Google CTF was over, I wanted to take that opportunity, take that time to go learn from some of the pros, some of the guys that are really doing this and actually do a good job. And when I can't even solve the most basic beginner, easy peasy 50 point challenge, that's a cool slap in the face. So I'm over on CTF time, ctftime.org, and I see we do have new write-ups out, and Google CTF has plenty of write-ups that are available. I see one that is referenced to this beginner challenge that I'm looking at, so I'll click on that challenge specifically, and I want to look at some of these other write-ups. I've looked through a lot of these, I've looked through all the other write-ups, and a common trend that I found was people would solve this challenge with anger, or A-N-G-R, and maybe you haven't heard of that, maybe you have, uh, Either way, I do want to try and showcase it, but keep in mind, I am operating at like the edge of my understanding. This is new territory for me. I haven't played with anger before, so 
Uh, hope you don't mind me shooting from the hip here, and hopefully we can still do some cool stuff and maybe learn something new. So if you wanted to, you could click through all of these write-ups. And again, I'm, I'm just trying to be honest, showcasing this and exploring it. But uh, I found that this one is actually really, really good in showcasing uh, using anger and what we can do here. They actually kind of follow the similar methodology that I do between using grep, strings, S-trace, P-trace, etc. Uh, they don't get anywhere with that, so they fire it up in Ghidra the same way that I did in that little demo. And they can say, hey, this is scrambled. We don't exactly know what it's doing. Uh, we could reverse engineer it, but that might be long and time consuming and boring and stupid. And if we know a utility that can kind of automatically do this for us, well, let's give that a go, or at least let's try it. So Anger. Anger is a Python framework for analyzing binaries. It combines static and dynamic or symbol analysis, concolic, I guess is the name of that or how you read that, making it applicable to a variety of tasks. So if you haven't seen it, let me Google Anger Python. And you can see Anger is a powerful and user-friendly binary analysis utility. They have a GitHub repository. It's put together by the Computer Security Lab at UC Santa Barbara or CEFCOM at Arizona State University and the associated CTF team, Shellfish. And it's a big name, right? I'm sure you guys have kind of heard of those. So it's a suite of Python 3 libraries. And I, and I always look at this code and I've seen Anger like write-ups that use this and they always have kind of funky, like either variable names or things that I'm just not as familiar with. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get this set up and try and work with it, work through it and showcase how we can build this using that write-up as a reference. I hope you don't mind. Again, I don't want this to be a stupid and boring video because, hey, you're just going over someone else's work. Uh, I'm trying to learn, and I hope we can all kind of learn from that. So we're getting a little meta. Anyway, uh, it does say regularly, the, the short version of how to install Anger is creating a little virtual environment and then just installing it with pip. So originally I thought like, oh, okay, sweet. I don't, I don't need to bother with a virtual environment then. I'll just pip install anger. And I think it like got it installed and then it was like not able to find some specific thing in CFFI and then like PyC tables and weirdness. So I kind of caved and was just like, you know what? I should probably do what the instructions actually tell me to do. So uh, let me show you that. MK virtual environment, PK. Uh, MK virtual environment, I actually don't know is a command or if it should be a command or if it's something that I should set up, whatever. Anyway, they're going ahead and creating in a virtual environment. We can do that. We know how to do that. I actually went ahead and put this in my just CTF directory. So I have a tool and something that I can reach as needed. So I'll use Python. I'll specify tack M to use a module and I'll use Ven or VNV to access that virtual environment module. Uh, when I type in Python, note that I am working off of Python 3.8. Python 2 is dead and off the table and should no longer be in consideration. So let's do mvenv with anger, anger being the name of this folder or the virtual environment that we're creating. And we're just using tack mvnv to go ahead and create that. So after that's done, I should have a directory here, anger, that I've created and that is the virtual environment. So I need to go ahead and activate that. So I will source anger bin activate. And you can see my prompt changes. Now I'm in anger and I'll go ahead and uh, install it. There we go. That's gonna take a little bit of time, pull all that stuff down, get it all configured for me, but there we go. We're in business with anger. <laughs> After a lot of blood and red on the screen, it will actually be like, yeah, we did it. So that's great. I'll pause this and I'll get back to you as soon as it's done. Okay. Now we're back at it. Okay. So let me hop into anger or actually let me go back to our Google CTF directory where we had that beginner challenge because we have the file here. And what I'm going to do is verify that I do have anger installed. Like can I import anger without a problem. Yes. I get a regular Python prompt back. So I know that that's success. I know anger is built off of Clarify or Clarapy. I don't know how you pronounce that. So you guys are going to teach me here. And that also runs just fine. So let me take this beginner write up and kind of let that be a reference for me as I kind of walk you through this. Because what we're going to end up doing is we're going to end up creating a script. Let's go ahead 
and just subble like a winner dot pi or ape dot pi and we'll start as we always do with our shebang line but let's import anger and import clarify and as we know that should work totally just fine no issues with that great now we want to figure out and get kind of kind of see the the methodology and, and framework that we need to have in mind to solve this problem we're given a binary that does kind of peculiar and specific things. All it does is just ask, hey, what's the flag? Tell me, and I'll tell you whether you're right or wrong. But because we can kind of see here, given the source code and everything that we analyze, it looks like it's asking for 16 bytes. So probably it's, it's in C, right? It's compiled. So maybe we're expecting a null byte at the very, very end of the string. So maybe that actual flag is just 15 bytes. We know that, and we know that we'll get a binary, true or false, yes or no, success or failure, depending on whether or not we got the right answer. So we kind of want to know where in the binary is that, because we'll let anger do some magic and brute force and hammer and do its symbolic execution to flow through and follow and find the correct input that this program needs to actually get to that segment of code to get into that code path where it is a successful input. So we need to go determine the address of where those things are and where that happens. I'm just going to go ahead and simply click on this put success line. And you can see kind of over here in the disassembly, we do have hex values as to where this procedure begins, right? I'm clicking on puts and I'm in this, the middle of that code block. That actually is, let me go back there. Clicking on puts, it highlights this one here. So the very start of this looks like 10111D. Uh, let me say that that is success address. Hex that thing. And come back to Ghidra, please. If I were to check out what failure is, that happens over here at 0010110. <laughs> Great, reading binary when it's actually hex. So uh, let me correct my typo there for success address and failure address. That will also be hex. I'll slap that in. And we need to know where this binary is actually getting loaded or how it's starting or where all of this really takes place. So it needs to know the base address. And Ghidra can tell us that. Actually, if we just literally scroll all the way up to the top, the very, very start here of all these instructions of everything that this program is going to do, that's going to be the base address, like right there. So it'll kickstart at 00100000. Let me take note of that. Let's use base address and note that as that 0x value. Okay. So now we've got kind of those ingredients and we know that we can work with those. We also want to be cognizant of the length of the flag that we're actually going to end up getting. So we mentioned, okay, we know the flag length. They ask for input of 16 bytes, and we're assuming that that very, very last one is a null byte or maybe just hitting enter or whatever the case may be. Uh, so let's just create a flag length variable, and let's say that's going to end up being 15 bytes in length. So then we'll do, and I'll bring this in so you can see it because, again, I, I, I'm being truthful here, taking a look at some other's code to see how they solve this and what they did here. They're going to specify a project or an anger project with the binary, and they'll pass in that base address that we're looking for. So you, we could copy and paste that, sure, but it wouldn't be any good learning for us. So let's try and do that ourselves. Let's create a project, and that's going to be an anger capital project. And we have imported anger over here, so that's totally fine to use. And we need the file or the binary that we're actually working with. That's going to be that dot slash a dot out in our case. And we'll need to specify some options or those main ops that you saw as a keyword argument. We need to specify that base address or base ADDR. That's how they reference it in kind of this dictionary. Um, I had gone ahead and called that variable base address all spelt out there. Maybe for our consistency, we can remove that and make it ADDR. But regardless, now we've gone ahead and created that project. Good. Showcasing this one more time, 
Now they do something interesting that I haven't seen before and I needed to do some research on. So this is me learning and hopefully that'll help you. Uh, they create this flag characters list and array. You can see that by the, the, the square braces here. And they create this object, clarify.bvs. So I wanted to learn a little bit more about the relationship between anger and clarify. And let me zoom in on that as I do my research. Anger's solver engine is called Clarify. That's how it's going to actually be doing its interesting magic and trying to determine theory and symbolic execution and determining and guessing and filling in information as it finds it. Uh, and that's how that's all put together. Clarify is just the vessel and the name of that, that concept and that idea. But the, you do interesting things with that because you're going to fill in or at least create the placeholder for the information that you don't know. So we don't know what the flag is and we want to know what the flag is. That's our objective, right? So they create, and you saw this in the syntax here, they're using this clarify.bvs syntax. And I'm like, what the heck is BVS? I don't know. I've, I've never heard of that or seen that before. Doing some of that research, kind of diving into that documentation here, a BV, that is a bit vector, whether symbolic, like just with a name, kind of like a variable, or concrete or with a value. And you specify the size there. So looking at this example code, they're specifying a 32-bit symbolic vector X. You can see the syntax BVS, so S for symbolic. X will be the name there, and it's going to be 32 bits. So referring back to our code, when they create a... BVS or bit vector that's symbolic, they're going to create a flag variable name for this. And the percent D is actually going to be a little format specifier based off of I. And we didn't see I anywhere else in this code yet. It's actually carried on because this is going to do some list comprehension. And it's going to be eight bits. So eight bits is one byte right? So these are literally going to be all of the flag characters. And it's, it's using list comprehension to create all of this in a list and for I in range flag length. So it's just, it's creating the flag, each character by character as a list that Clarify and Anger will be able to know how to use. So let's steal that. Not, not steal, but you know, <laughs> flag characters can be a list comprehension based off of that Clarify BVS or a symbolic bit vector. And we'll call it flag, you can call it character with the specific ID, whatever you want. Actually, let me use an F string. We'll do some interesting Python three things and make sure that maybe that'll behave. Flag care I. So I will be our iterator and we do want it to be eight bits in length so that it's a, a full byte, good enough for i in range of that flag length that we've defined. Perfect. We have that list generated and created there now. And they bring this together into a flag variable or object. They concatenate, I don't know why they use this asterisk here. That was kind of an oddball to me. But if you do that, it's actually going to end up expanding out that list. So it puts all those together and adds a, another list object with a sim, single element, an entry, and that's going to be a BVV. So we recognize that. We saw the BV earlier as a bit vector, but now with a V. So not symbolic, but with an actual value that we specified. So it's just going to specify a byte for a new line here. We enter that in, we just whack that. So scanf, or how the program is reading our input, it'll actually be able to take that input. It's like us hitting the enter key and it's just adding it in, right? So let's pull that into our code just as well. We'll create a flag object and that's going to be that clarify class or module that we're calling it. And we're going to concatenate our flag characters that we've created. And we're going to add in that other single byte just inside this list here. That's going to be a bit vector value with the B prefix to denote that it's a byte and then a new line. So you could have the comment here. So standard in works or whatever. So it actually accepts it. So we hit that enter key. Okay. Then we go ahead and do some anger boilerplate stuff that I hadn't exactly seen before. I just, I'm just not familiar with that syntax yet, right? Because I don't use this project all, that all the time. I don't use anger often, but I want to get a little bit better at it. I want to get smarter at it. So we use that project object. And we take the factory, 
which I guess is just how it's going to access its runtime or the module stuff to get it to do things. And we'll run full in its state with the arguments there. And we're going to use anger options unicorn. I don't know what that is. List of state options. So I'll Google, I'll just research. These may be passed with mode equals to a state constructor. Are we starting a state? Yes, we are. We full initialize a state. Unicorn. Options that enable the unicorn engine for executing on concrete data. Hmm. I'll have to do a little bit more learning on that, I think. And there's a lot, obviously a lot here. Like there's a whole kind of little online book to get started and learn a little bit more of the concepts and how it all works within Anger. Simulation managers and program states, though, when we are letting anger flow through and work through and simulate all the potential inputs and work that maybe this will work with. Anyway, let's go ahead and grab our code here to initialize that state. We'll go ahead and create a state, and we'll make that to be our project factory. And it's full initialize or init if I can type state with these arguments here. We'll specify args to be running our program dot slash a dot out. And maybe we could have captured that if we needed to. And the options that we supply, and that was that weird thing I was trying to Google and learn a little bit more about earlier, the unicorn options so it can work and work with this data. Standard in what we are gonna end up passing along to this program, what we're going to give it to run with, well, that's going to be that flag object that we just created. And because those are symbolic bit vectors, Anger is gonna try and figure out and learn what the proper input there might actually be for us. But we'll have to pass that in as the flag. Great. Okay. Now, if I scroll down a little bit more here, it looks like we can go ahead and create a simulation manager or simger. And we saw that as I was simply looking around and Googling. Simulation managers let you wrangle multiple states in a very slick way. States are organized into stashes that you can step forward, filter, merge, and move around as you wish. Oh, that's very cool. It allows you to control symbolic execution over groups of states simultaneously applying search strategies to explore a program state space. So it'll try and work through and find all of these different code paths and it can step through each of them or do different things to move around in them. I'm just going to let anger go. <laughs> like we'll give it the, the start position in the end or like the, the directions and the, the road signs that it needs because it's going to end up finding or avoiding a specific address. But let's start to create that. So simger equals proj.factory simulation manager, and we pass in our state. So I'll call it sim manager equals anger dot, oh, I'm sorry, sorry. I, I, need, to, I need to be able to see this. I can't just <laughs> balance that while trying to speak at the same time. Apparently it is a factory member called simulation manager, and we pass in our state. Great. Now, because we've already defined this find address and a void address, or essentially like the success that we want to find, when we'll, it'll give us the flag and the failure that we don't want to find. This is like, okay, don't look over here, but look everywhere else starting at this position. So funnel your way through the maze until you find the goal in the end, but don't run into any traps or spikes or bad things. Don't go to this address that will lead us to failure and not finding the flag. So let's work with that. Looks like all we need to do is run that simulation manager, tell it to explore with find equal the success address and avoid equals the failure address. I'll bring that over uh, just here. Simulation manager, and it's called sim manager in my case. Let's go ahead and explore, and we've defined these variables already ahead. Find this success address, and then avoid this failure address. Great. He's just gonna run now, he's just gonna go. So if we haven't found anything, 
or if we have found anything, excuse me, if the length of what we found in the simulation manager is greater than zero, well, okay, go ahead and display that out to us. For every single thing that you found, we wanna see that object and POSIX, it sounds like. Uh, I wonder if I can actually kind of drill down and find out what that is. Anger POSIX dumps, emulated file system. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So we can actually zoom in on the process that we're working with, right? The file system, socket pipes or terminals in a SIM file, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah. just tell me how to do what I want to do. They go over this interesting abstract example with the simulated file. Where is the notion of POSIX? Let me search for POSIX. You may access the mapping from a file descriptor number to a file descriptor object in state.posix.filedescriptor, or FD. So we know that standard output is file descriptor zero. So that's, that's what we could be looking for. And their code actually defines, oh, standard in, standard in? Standard in is zero, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Standard out is one, and standard in is what it's actually going to be obviously entering into the program. And that's what we're mangling, that's what we're trying to uncover, that is the flag itself. So let me go ahead and, and, and get that here. If the length of the sim manager has found more than one thing, so if, if the sim manager has found anything, what we wanna do is we wanna loop through each of those entries for found in sim manager found. Let's go ahead and in, excuse me, thank you. Let's go ahead and display what they found. Found is a state, as we know, from reading that documentation. And POSIX will allow us to see specific file descriptors. Looks like dump will display an S, I'm assuming will give us a string. And zero for our standard in file descriptor. And because our standard input is what we're trying to mangle with a symbolic value here, and it's gonna solve that with Clarify, it'll figure that out. Maybe that will work for us. So I think we've got some stuff here. Let's take a look. Let me run Python winner, slap that in, see if anger will just run off the races. Proj is not defined. Oh, excuse me, I called it project. Proj this guy. I'll do that just as well there. You guys were probably already screaming at your computer telling me that I was wrong. Thank you. I appreciate it. Let's see if he gets anything now or if we have any other errors. Looks like he's running. Looks like he's going. And he found something, but not what we want. CTF and a null byte, apparently, and other random bytes. A couple printable letters. Okay. So that doesn't work. Um, well, we can actually kind of get a sanity check here, right? Because obviously we're typing in the flag on the keyboard ourselves, and that's gonna end up being real regular letters and numbers and things we can type, like printable characters, right? So what we could do is we could kind of limit um, what Clarify or what anger is going to try and find and determine, and we could, we could set some bounds or some ranges to say, look, I, everything that you find, I want you to make sure that's actually going to be within a certain ASCII range. Like it's got to be greater than or less than uh, certain amounts so that it's in the printable character space and not these random wonky null bytes or other non-printable characters and bytes. So they actually showcase this in the section here in the code and I totally drove right by it, actually purposefully. <laughs> uh, so don't give me too much flack. I did intend for us to skip over that because I wanted to kind of squeeze in that nugget and hopefully maybe that was a, a decent learning point. Is like, okay, let's realize and know what we did wrong and maybe what we could come up with it following that. Because these raw bytes, these null bytes, these random things, that should not be in our flag. So what they do is they take the flag characters like list here that we've created for all these big vector symbolics here. These eight bits that we're trying to figure out, this byte for every single character in the flag, we need to add some limitations or constraints so we can say every single one of those characters in the solver, 
that we're using inside of the state as we run this program, we need to be able to say, okay, this is going to end up being greater than maybe the ordinal character of this. And this exclamation point would probably tell me that's the very, very start of the ASCII table where the printable characters begin. And then this tilde tells me that's gotta be the very, very end of the, the ASCII table. So let me verify that uh, just so we all believe me. There we go. No bytes, no bytes, no bytes things. Does it show me non-printable characters here? Oh, probably. For convenience below are more compact tables in, in hex. So this is gonna end up being the printable character range and set. And looks like there are obviously ranges outside of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All this stuff, all this weirdness. So the exclamation point is where we start to have regular normal things that we humans can read and understand just fine. And then up to tilde. Obviously anything after 7F will be not a byte that we will be able to make sense out of as, as people with eyes. <laughs> So let's use that. Let's use that code. Let's use that syntax. It's cool that they use ORD here to be able to get that like actual decimal value, the data there. So let me steal that. <laughs> Stealing is not the right word, but uh, they do for an iterator in their flag characters. I'll use C because that matches character a little bit more. The state that we've defined, that solver that's going to use, we need to add a constraint that's going to be actually within the ASCII character range that's printable. So I'll use that exclamation point to note the ordinal value, um, or at least to note the beginning of the ASCII table where the printable stuff starts. Same thing with the tilde to note the very, very end. And now we've specified that as some constraints for our state here. Good enough. Okay, now let's try and run that. See if he gets anything better or new or something interesting and peculiar. There we go. Uh, SIMD for me? <laughs> CTF SIMD for me. Well, that's clearly very much a flag. That looks like it's... it's it is what it should be. That looks like we got it. We, we, we did it with anger. That was awesome. Very first time. <laughs> and we could go ahead and submit that if you wanted to. We've got uh, the Google CTF up here. Make my face move out of the way so you can see the glory of this. Insert flag, submit flag, and then hopefully it'll give me that cool animation like, you did it, flag accepted. All right, flag captured. Nice, great, good, easy except not. <laughs> Obviously, this is, is new stuff for me. I hope you were able to bear with me and I hope it was kind of fun and maybe some enjoyable to, stuff to, to walk through this. But that was my first time using Anger. This, this is a little bit new to me, so I am kind of going to reference the things that are out there in the world and I don't think there's any shame in that, especially if you're learning and getting started on this. But I think I wanted to boil it down to there were some key ingredients that we needed to know. We needed to be able to kind of tell Anger where to start or that base address and Ghidra can give us that. The addresses of where we want to go and where we don't want to go, where we can find the flag and where we know, hey, we failed at finding the flag. And then obviously the length of what we're looking for. So we have those, we ha we have those placeholders for the data that we need to determine and figure out. And Anger feels like dark magic. It can just like crank through this and figure it out and solve it. Really, really cool. Really, really neat. Um, I, I, I'd love to be able to do more with this, so I'm excited to be able to tinker with it. But that is that. Um, please go check out these write-ups. Please go check out other things. And, and please do try and learn if this is new to you too. It, it is for me, but I hope this was hopefully a fun a little safari ride to go on to uh, showcase anger and solve one of the challenges. Another, another easy baby beginner one from Google CTF. But... I hope you guys enjoyed that. So thank you so much for watching. If you did like this video, please do press that like button. Maybe leave me a comment. I'd be super grateful if you would subscribe. And I hope you guys are enjoying this series of videos lately. I'm trying to keep it busy for us. Uh, but feed that YouTube algorithm, you know, you know. All right. Thanks for watching, everybody. I love you. I'll see you in the next video. Take care. With the, with the